directly or it at the edge that you do with mobility. Our projects are divided over whole Austria and have different project goals. I think this is a, a really a common uh, graph, which probably you have seen in various ways, but pretty much uh, it always says the same. We, were, we should use hydrogen where we have long distance, where we need a short filling time and where we uh, have uh, uh, where we need a high uh, efficiency. Basically, this means in the field of aviation, shipping and heavy duty. Hydrogen is the way to go. On the hand, when we think uh, about urban mobility uh, in uh, the field of passenger cars, petrol electric vehicles are more appropriate. Now I will uh, shortly speak uh, about some projects we have within Viva. Uh, Hydrac and the follow-up project FC4HD uh, deals with uh, a heavy-duty drug. Hydrain there uh, is uh, as that the project name uh, already uh, might uh, might uh, show. Uh, it uh, is about uh, uh, a drain in this context, a narrow gauge drain. H2 meets H2O is a project which uh, looked at uh, shipping. And uh, furthermore, we have uh, uh, projects like Up High and High West, which look at the whole value chain from uh, the uh, production to uh, the usage of hydrogen in industry as well as uh, mobility. When we look globally, basically, uh, a big amount of uh, countries already has implemented a hydrogen strategy or announced to have a hydrogen strategy in preparation. Um, the blue ones already have one and uh, the yellow ones uh, announced uh, to have a strategy in preparation. This graph is uh, from uh, uh, the uh, ES EIC TCP hydrogen report from uh, last year. So basically the politics exists. When we look in Austria, in uh, the context of mobility, um, it is uh, told within the host, uh, Austrian strategy, which was published last year, we want to uh, prioritize uh, the usage of hydro hydrogen in the field of aviation and shipping. Uh, not that much, but also in the field of for long haul drugs and buses, but not really for light duty vehicles. In the Austrian uh, strategy, we always speak from green um, hydrogen, so based of renewables. Uh, globally, uh, we have 80,000 fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. Uh, this is an overall number. This seems not bad, I would say, uh, because compared to the sales uh, last year, it's uh, a plus of 30%. This is the cumulative number, uh, but still, 
less than 1% of the global vehicle sales are from uh, are hydrogen electric vehicles, also fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, still, there is a progress when we uh, look uh, what the OEMs are doing. Um, 130 different models are expected to be assembled in this year. The majority is uh, for of uh, commercial vehicles, basically trucks and buses, and the majority of the OEMs uh, comes from China. Um, we don't only need, of course, vehicles, we also need the uh, infrastructure. And uh, this graph from the Hydrogen Council of this year shows where the hydrogen refueling stations are situated globally. The highest amount is clearly in, uh, the, in Asia. But uh, furthermore, there's a big amount uh, uh, of stations in uh, America. Uh, of course, if we, we, we uh, sum up all stations uh, uh, from Europe and Middle East, uh, which is uh, shown here in, uh, in uh, green, it's higher than those I have uh, now mentioned in America, but the growing rate there is higher. Um, in general, we see over the last year that the growing uh, uh, of uh, implemented, built up uh, hydrogen refueling stations have increased, especially in the Asian Pacific uh, uh, area. Uh, an interesting example is those of South Korea, I think, because when we look at Austria and Europe, as mentioned before, heavy duty, shipping, aviation. But South Korea is an interesting example that uh, it uh, can also go in the light duty uh, area if the politics want to. Um, in uh, South Korea, already nearly 30,000 uh, uh, passenger cars uh, uh, powered by hydrogen uh, exists. And until 2030, they want to have 300,000. They have also a really high amount of uh, hydrogen refueling stations in uh, South Korea already uh, implemented or uh, built. It's uh, over 200. So it uh, goes hand in hand. We need, uh, so if we want to force. Um, uh, a, a technology, we also need uh, to have uh, all the needed environment around it. If we want to have uh, vehicles on the road, we need the necessary infrastructure for it. Uh, challenges and needs. Uh, well, it's always a bit the chicken egg, uh, egg problem. If we don't have the infrastructure, we will not uh, have users which are willing to buy vehicles. When we think of Austria, we have uh, seven HRS and we only have a small amount of vehicles. When I speak, uh, I mean public here. But pub uh, public uh, uh, HRS and of course there are several um, um, companies which have their own refueling stations. Um, but of course, if when we think on the uh, sub, uh, on the operators of uh, 
refueling stations, they will not be willing to uh, build those if they are not uh, customers. It uh, must be also um, profitable for them to invest such high amounts for building uh, such infrastructure. So uh, when we want to um, to get more uh, fuel cell uh, electric vehicles on the road, we also need to have the infrastructure for it. And uh, a new technology, of course, it's uh, we can say hydrogen is not completely new, but uh, it's uh, it's not a completely new technology, but still it's a market which is built up in this decade and not uh, some decades ago when uh, all the knowledge or most of the knowledge already about hydrogen existed. Um, with a new technology, uh, we need support mechanism to overcome barriers. Because if we have uh, a technology with a lower TRL, with lower uh, amount uh, of, uh, of uh, offers, we don't have uh, the economic of scale effects which makes something uh, cheaper we don't have all the knowledge we need and so we need uh, something like funding uh, which uh, helps to get something in the market um, also a bit of a barrier, a barrier is uh, the legal framework and also uh, the speed of authority processes, uh, processes which we have right now. Um, as example, when we build something in Austria, based on this, it's really new. Uh, all around hydrogen, not all the guidelines exist. And so the legal uh, framework is not clear, clearly defined. And uh, some uh, requirements can be different uh, based uh, on the uh, location where uh, the, um, the, the infrastructure is built up. So we need a uniform legal framework to overcome such uh, uncertainties. And also the problem we have, of course, everywhere, and this is not special in the field of uh, hydrogen or mobility, uh, authority processes are slow. And uh, it's would be helpful if this could uh, go faster to uh, implement something new, to get the approval to implement something. And last but not least, uh, knowledge is a topic uh, which uh, is not always the best around hydrogen. So, a common of the public, uh, of uh, the ordinary people, they are often afraid that hydrogen is dangerous. They think uh, on accidents, explosion, and so on, when they hear the word hydrogen. And as we have seen, as we know, based on the various uh, projects which had been implemented uh, until now, that it's there is no safety issue. And of course, we need openness to new technologies. Um, we need this from the potential future users that they are willing to uh, change that they are willing to use uh, uh, a 
a new fuel for their mobility, for their way of moving. Um, and uh, also, it's it's hard because we are, we are used to something. Uh, it's hard to adapt. If you think of now, now it's common. The, the development uh, of uh, drugs shows that uh, the users want to have a mileage of about uh, uh, 1,000 kilometers without uh, another refueling. But it's how much uh, kilometers are really needed when we think about the intervals which are uh, forced for drivers for their resting periods. It's not possible that a driver drives that long on a street and commonly only one driver drives a truck and there's not a separate uh, driver with the truck. So it would be also possible if the uh, tank if the uh, possible mileage of a fuel cell electric vehicle uh, would be lower. And uh, also it's it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's sad, it's bad that there is somehow something like a, a fight between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. It's not a, comp a competition between the two technologies. We will need both. We did, will need several technologies to overcome uh, our challenges. For decarbonization, not hydrogen, is the only key. But it, it, is, it is a part of what we will need. And last but not least, I want to say uh, hydrogen is, of course, important for the mobility sector. But when we think on this sector, we have also there to think about how it all got, uh, gets together in the whole economic system. We have to produce the hydrogen. We have to transport it. When we uh, import it from somewhere, we have to think in what kind we import it, uh, direct as hydrogen or a uh, derivative, uh, uh, and uh, how we can store it. And also, we will need hydrogen also for the industry. So. It's not only thinking about how we can manage or force the usage of hydrogen in the mobility sector. It's more about how all comes together and how hydrogen can uh, play a part in the transformation of our uh, um, energy system. So basically, that was my presentation and I give Back. Hey, thank you, Manuela. Um, it was really inter interesting to listen to you. Uh, we will share your slides afterwards with the participants. And I have a question now if, to the participants. Has anyone got a question? If yes, just please unmute yourself and ask Manuela directly. If not, we will hand out, as I said, the presentation afterwards. So you will get her contact data, I guess. Uh, Manuela, you will share your contact data as well? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you will get your contact data and you can get in touch with Manuela afterwards as well. Thank you very much. I will now ask Graham Brown um, from the city of Aberdeen um, to start your presentation about uh, the logistics of hydrogen and uh, the infrastructure of hydrogen. Thanks Doris, thank you very much and um, thanks everyone for coming along and allowing me some time to to share some of our journey. If you don't mind I'll turn my camera off while I share my screen. I'm a wee bit worried about my internet connection but we'll try this two seconds.
bear with me. It's just trying to come up now. Hopefully you can see that. Yes, we can see your screen. OK, thanks, Doris. Yeah, so my name is Graham, Graham Brown, and I'm part of the team here in Aberdeen City Council who have been developing the test case and the use case for hydrogen, particularly within public service delivery. Uh, that's been our main aim over the past 10 years, is to use the hydrogen as a concept and see if we can deliver our public services with it. And uh, this is our, our kind of branding, if you like, and hydrogen is here and it's very much the case. We, as I say, we have been utilising hydrogen as a fuel source for the past 10 years and in a number of, of use cases, and I'll go on to tell you what some of those are just now. Now, Aberdeen City Council are quite unique in terms of the other 32 or 31 local authorities in Scotland. We're not a big country, but uh, approximately 5 million people. But we made the conscious decision in the northeast of Scotland to um, really uh, accelerate the use of renewable energy within our public service for a number of reasons. The main one is we are really reliant on the oil and gas sector, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. We think around 10% of people are directly employed within the industry. Anecdotally, if you if you live and work here, every second person you meet has some kind of connection with oil and gas. It's really embedded within the community. So we recognise that in order to move on through the transition into a more greener transition with more renewable uh, energy sources, we really need to keep one eye on the local economy. So this was an economic decision some 10, 15 years ago to really accelerate the use case of hydrogen. We think that around 68%, maybe 75% of people that are directly employed within the, the oil and gas sector can transition with the skills they have over to the low carbon sector quite easily. And we've done, carried out a number of pieces of research with higher education and industry to, to be fairly confident in that number. So those people that are currently working within the oil and gas sector could probably transition over to the renewable sector, sector quite easily. In terms of the policy background, well, hydrogen policy and principal funding in the northeast of Scotland comes from both national, UK national, European and regional government to facilitate local government delivery. Um, the hydrogen projects in the region to date have been designed really to progress two things, and that's uh, the delivery of the delivery of that government policy, but also supporting the aspiration of energy transition to a post oil and gas energy sector. This has been the main driver in terms of policy over the past 15, 10 years. And we're now at a point where Aberdeen's hydrogen programme is moving towards uh, economic sustainability. A lot of the progress to date has been based around grants and different project funding. But we want to now get to a stage where through co-investment, both public and private funds, and public and private funds uh, would see the sector mature and would start to, start to see some commercial returns on our activity within the hydrogen sector. Now, I'll go on to the business case in a moment, but that has been difficult in terms of the financials to date. OK, so this is a, a kind of brief timeline on our journey and where it all started. Uh, apologies, it's quite a detailed slide, but uh, we really started planning in earnest back in 2013. As a region, as a local authority, as I say, we, we made the, the, the conscious decision to really accelerate the investment and the use case of hydrogen. And from there, we've, we've we've taken part in a number of different programs and projects, and that has led to the whole ecosystem growing here in the northeast of Scotland. To, as I say, to an now as a place where hydrogen is actually an essential part of the public service uh, service delivery needs that we have. And there's a number of projects here that I'll just highlight quickly. So we developed our strategy uh, around 2015, and as part of that, we we took part in the first hydrogen bus. Uh, project uh, through a number of Van Hool manufactured buses, single deckers at the time. And we then started progressing on to more test case uh, situations, demonstration projects of vehicles, and we've built two publicly available hydrogen refueling stations. 
it was actually really interesting to see Manuela's slide about the number of uh, hydrogen ref refueling stations in the UK were actually losing a few. We did have 12. I think we're down to about nine now, which is a bit of a shame. So I still think we're in the peaks and troughs of trying to, to um, build the infrastructure required. Uh, again, that chicken and egg situation. So we've got two publicly available hydrogen stations in the northeast. There's not another one in Scotland. So we can only do base to base type journeys. You can't, if, for example, travel from Aberdeen to any of the other cities, uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh, because there's no refueling station there. Uh, we then moved on uh, towards the end of the decade where we have utilised hydrogen within one of our large conference facility and hotel complexes. This is quite a, an exciting project. We've got a large um, venue which is powered by hydrogen. And since then, because we've had these refueling stations, we've had that kind of platform, the foundation, we've really increased the number of mobility fleet vehicles that we use. And we're now, as I say, at a stage where we're looking to commercialise the use case of hydrogen. So we've got a joint venture with BP, which I'll come on to talk about in a minute, uh, taking it to the next level in terms of hydrogen availability. So some of the some of the mobility projects in a little bit more detail. As I talked about, this was our first real foray into the, the transport sector with hydrogen. Uh, 2015, we, we took part in uh, the largest bus trial at the time in Europe, and we received 10 fuel cell buses. And at the time, this was quite interesting, they cost around about £1.2 million per bus. Um, I think anybody involved with, with this particular project will agree that uh, it wasn't without its problems in terms of the durability and availability of the buses to be on the road all the time was challenging. And um, we uh, we learned a lot from this project, uh, particularly when looking to deliver that public service with buses. I know there's another pre presentation around buses, but this was a really good use case in terms of all the challenges that are presented by utilising hydrogen buses at the time. We've since uh, rehomed all 10 buses. They're now generally used with educational facilities up and down the UK to demonstrate the use of fuel cell within transport. Um, yeah, these, these were the two refueling stations that I mentioned. Um, our first station uh, built back in 2015 um, delivers around 360 kilograms a day of hydrogen and that can be refueled at 350 and 700 bar. Um, and then the second one uh, is slightly bigger and can build, a, it can uh, generate uh, around 360. So the first one is 130 and the second one is 360. So a total of about 500 kilograms a day available within the city for hydrogen based uh, vehicles. Generally, we refuel cars, vans, buses, and large vehicles, and I'll come on to show you what those are. But um, they are both green tariff stations. So we do advocate that uh, these stations deliver green hydrogen, but that's from a green electricity tariff. So they are from a renewable source. Just, just the last thing on the, the refueling stations, they, they, it's, it's very topical because they're coming towards the end of their lifespan now. So they have a commission around 2015 and 2017. So the oldest has been in play about 10 years. And we are seeing actually that uh, a lot of the components, a lot of the moving parts are actually needing replaced uh, at a considerable cost. We think the electrolyzer to replace at the moment would be about 1.2 to 1.5 million pounds. And these were these were built with heavy subsidy, particularly from European funding. So we're now at a stage where that commercialization is very important to make the financial stand up to having a hydrogen refueling station that um, doesn't require huge subsidy. At the moment, we are charging around £19 a kilogram. That's £19 a kilogram for hydrogen. Uh, the average over the lifespan of the refueling stations has been around about £11 to £12. So I think it's important, particularly when um, doing any financial forecasting or business case development, that we avoid the temptation to try and get parity with the likes of diesel, uh, but just because the price and the finances don't stack up. We know this is a policy led decision making process at the moment. Happy to explain more on that uh, later on. 
Yeah, so we've got one of the, we like to boast that we've got one of the largest and most varied fleets of hydrogen vehicles in Europe. Um, the, the message behind this picture is it's not just Aberdeen City Council vehicles that utilise hydrogen in the region. These are a number of our local partners. Um, there's a Royal Mail van in there, so our local post office uh, service utilises hydrogen within their vans. Um, and, uh, and we've got a number of different vehicles and cars and buses in play, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight some of the, those to you now. Um, just starting in the top left, this is one of our road sweepers. Um, we've probably got around 45 vehicles within Aberdeen City Council that utilise hydrogen in various capacities. Uh, our road sweepers have tend to be, we have three road sweepers now that are hydrogen. They tend to be the most reliable in terms of hydrogen vehicles that we use. This particular road sweeper has two engines, one to drive the vehicle and one to actually operate the road sweeping machinery. We call it a donkey engine. But um, the feedback from our fleet operatives is they really like this vehicle. It's very quiet, it's very clean and it's been well received by the community. We are there's a number, of, I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but there's a number of vehicles in terms of cars that we use in the city. We've engaged with Hyundai and Toyota. We have around 30 cars across the region. Uh, we have a number on our publicly available car club. So the members of the public can join the club and then utilize hydrogen cars. And also a number of our community partners. So people like um, our health and social care, our car parking attendants, all utilise uh, the hydrogen cars and again they've been well received. Moving moving on into that larger truck type capacity, we've been taking part in an interreg programme called HECTA, which is trialling the use of hydrogen fueled refuse collection vehicles. So we started this project in 2019, that's the truck in the top right of the uh, 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 on the slide. Now this is again Manuela hinted that um, we really are in the research and development stage of large vehicles of this type. So the seven partners involved in the project have found that getting a reliable fit for purpose hydrogen RCV is not quite market ready as yet. Basically these vehicles are kind of hand built at the moment, very prototype uh, type approach. So part of the challenge over the past three years of this project is trying to keep the truck on the road it's got a 15 kilogram tank for hydrogen. Potentially, uh, when it has been running, it's been a fantastic asset to the fleet. Again, very quiet, very clean. The drivers like to use it. And um, we think that it will form, hydrogen RCVs will form a large part of our fleet going forward in conjunction with battery electric um, RCVs. I'll maybe come on to a bit more of that as we progress. And then lastly, there the other vehicle we are again, this is another interreg inter program. We are going to test the use case of car hydrogen powered cargo bikes. We've ordered six. They're due to come next month. And we've got local partners involved in the project. Again, Royal Mail, various other delivery type organizations that that can help uh, with that first mile, last mile clean um, logistics agenda. We have a low emission zone coming into the city next summer, 2024. So the type of ve vehicle will be restricted access into the city centre. And we see this as a good test case for low emission vehicle delivery within the city centre. OK, yeah, maybe you can see the cars there and I don't know what happened to that slide. But... In terms of buses, again, I know there's another presentation, but we are, we're quite we're quite proud, and we always say that we were the world's first test case for hydrogen double decker buses. So we have a partnership with uh, Wright Bus, uh, which is a company based in Northern Ireland in a place called Ballymena, and it's operated by First Bus, and we've got a current fleet of around 15 in the city. Uh, with 10 additional buses due to be delivered this summer. So we'll have a fleet of 25 hydrogen double-decker buses. And uh, I have repeated this, but they are the buses are probably one of the nicest things about the city. They are uh, really well received by the community. Uh, First bus like to operate them. And um, what we found, uh, as I talked about earlier, in terms of the hydrogen 
availability, now that stations are coming to the end of their life, we are having a few problems in terms of hydrogen availability for the buses. So we've had to reduce the number on the on the actual road down to about five at times while we sort out the, the hydrogen refueling stations. So again, that infrastructure is very, very important in terms of allowing the mobility agenda to progress. So that's our buses. Now, what we found over the past 10, 15 years when looking at our procurement strategies for purchasing hydrogen vehicles is they're not really market ready. They're not really on the shelf ready to buy. Um, as we know, a lot of them do come, a lot of the moving parts anyway, a lot of the supply chain is, is, is based in the Far East. And um, this has presented a number of problems for our fleet managers purchasing vehicles. So in the interim, what we've progressed is um, what we call a H2 iced um, approach. And this is a dual fuel um, vehicle. So the, it's a diesel engine, it's a diesel truck. So we can go out and buy a diesel. This, In this case, this is a road sweeper and a, an RCV. We can go out and buy these diesels uh, at the market rate, which is much cheaper. And then we can do a conversion on the engine. So the, the engine will then take diesel and hydrogen. And it can reduce emissions up to around 40%, which is dependent on a number of factors, including driver behavior. But we see this as a bridging technology, which will allow us to develop the use case for hydrogen and build on that ecosystem while hydrogen vehicles become more market ready. So we have a quite an extensive program of conversion vehicles over the next few years. The plan is to take us up to about 100 vehicles that will use this technology. This year we're doing a, another 35 and um, as an example, uh, a diesel uh, bin lorry re a refuse collection vehicle will cost around about £150,000 and the conversion will be a further £40,000 on top of that. So you're talking just shy of £200,000 where uh, the fuel, the, the, where the Fuel hydrogen equivalent from the hectare program was around about five hundred and sixty thousand pounds. So you, it's more than half the price at the moment. So in terms of local authority service delivery and procurement strategy, the financials and the market availability are making it very difficult to progress the use of hydrogen to its to its maximum at the moment. Hence the dual fuel approach. In terms of commercialization, we are at, a, we are at a quite an exciting time at the moment. So we've got a joint venture with BP and that will see a new hydrogen refueling station and um, manufacturing foothold in the city. Phase one will provide a, a low cost green hydrogen uh, refueling station that will service the existing fleet, the existing third party demand, plus uh, uh, quite a considerable amount more, maybe up to 800 to 1000 kilograms of hydrogen available today. So maybe doubling what we have at the moment in the city. And we're due to go live early 2025 with this, with, with the thoughts being that we can build further phases into this. So phase two can then expand into that wider transport agenda. We have feasibility studies at the moment looking at maritime, so the large ships, rail as well. So we're, we're thinking phase two could produce more hydrogen for that sector. A train, uh, some people might correct me, but the train will use a far, far amount uh, in terms of hydrogen than a, a refuge collection vehicle, for example. So uh, the hectare vehicle has 15 kilograms, we think a train a week or a month, maybe, maybe about 50 tonnes. So the need for hydrogen is going to really, really accelerate in terms of which uh, vehicles is utilising. And then phase three is something that uh, that we're progressing all the time is in terms of our heat networks. We have had a few demonstration projects in Scotland looking at heat networks. I mentioned our um, exhibition centre. There's a various feasibility studies ongoing to see what it would take to convert the existing heating systems to take hydrogen within the city and beyond, which is potentially quite exciting. And also looking at that export market, there's not a huge amount of industry uh, in the northeast of Scotland that would, would need the hydrogen in, in terms of powering industry. But we have and we do have a number of partnerships ongoing looking at that potential future export market for, for green hydrogen. 
this is a plan of where that facility will be. So this is the northeast uh, coastline. This is the, the North Sea. But there you'll see where we're going to have a, a large solar farm. I think there's about 3,000 solar panels going in on what is a, a current landfill site. And that will generate the electricity needed for the electrolysis for the new hydrogen refueling station. So it'll be 100% green hydrogen. As part of phases two and three, we will connect in, you can't see it on this slide here, but we'll connect into the many and progressing wind farms that are off the northeast of Scotland. So really quite exciting development there in terms of future commercialization of hydrogen manufacture. Coming back to mobility, we have carried out uh, quite a wide review of a number of fleets similar to ourselves. So we looked at five similar local authorities five public and two private sector entities. Uh, we looked across some 4,000 different types of vehicles with the aim of trying to predict what the future procurement strategy might be in terms of battery, electric or hydrogen. And we think in terms of, uh, of those 4,000 vehicles that are in play at the moment, there's probably about 89 or 90 percent that could be zero emission vehicles. And with that, we think the majority will still be electric. Uh, those light commercial light commercial vans, the, the cars, probably about 60%, and then 32% we could go into fuel cell, your larger truck-based uh, platforms. We think the annual demand from that would be, would be around 745 tonnes of hydrogen, and that would be for the larger, valence, uh, larger vehicles. Uh, yeah, and there is a huge challenge, as I said, around the market availability for those vehicles to come into play. And the next slide will, will kind of demonstrate where we think we are with that. So this is a timeline and we've engaged with industry, the likes of Toyota and the large truck manufacturers, just to try and understand when market availability will be there for hydrogen cars, hydrogen uh, light commercial vehicles, refuge commercial, uh, collection vehicles and up to your rigid hydro, uh, larger trucks. So we're still, I mean, we're kind of, we're nearly at 2024 now, so we've still got a bit of time before, they think it'll be 2030, before really fleets up and down the country and indeed across the world can start buying and procuring these hydrogen vehicles with any great certainty. The feedback from the HECTA programme we've been working on at the moment is that manufacturers of refuse collection vehicles need another five years to do some real life on the road testing before they could be market available. So that's kind of in line with this timeline. So we've got another five to, five to 10 years really before we can go forward with any kind of certainty around our future procurement strategies. The worry with that, and it is a worry, as a, as a country we've committed to be um, net zero by 2045, but reduce our emissions, our current emissions by 75% by 2030. So. We're going to have to see a real acceleration of this market availability and the finances to back it up within the next five to 10 years. Lastly, and just to, just to summarise in terms of where we go next. So as I said, we've got, um, we're looking at our maintenance and infrastructure around the supporting the increase in fleet uh, vehicles that come on board, both dual fuel and hydrogen and electric. And we're going to look at a regional approach so, so we can support not just Aberdeen City Council, but those local authorities around us. Um, as part of that, we're looking at the portable refueling uh, possibilities so we can manufacture the hydrogen here in the city and then distribute it to our partners and, and, move, and refuel um, and, on a portable basis. We're carrying out more feasibility studies and demonstrations as they come available. Really disappointed our interreg cash cow has been turned off with Brexit, but uh, I'm assured there are other financial opportunities out there for us. And then we are really keen to facilitate future collaboration and other projects and really looking to support that investment program into the region, not just with BP, but with other uh, potential supply chain partners. And again, supporting regional stakeholders to position Scotland as a, as a hydrogen exporter. There's lots of activity in that space at the moment. Yeah, and that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of where we are as a as a region. Okay, Doris. Perfect. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, are there any questions? I'll stop sharing. 
Hello? That's yes, excellent. Damaris? Uh, Hello. Uh, 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 oh, can you see? Oh, no. Maybe I'll put my camera on so you can see me. <laughs> can you hear me? Hi. Uh, I'm Damaris Miller from Next Move in France. And I was wondering if uh, 10 years, because you said you started in 2013, is the is the timeline that's needed for a big city to implement that sort of project and and what could have um, stopped you or hindered you and what could have accelerated the movement if if you had had them? Yeah, thanks, Damaris. Uh, it's been 10 years for us. However, what I would say is uh, we like to think we were maybe the first movers on a lot of this technology. The, the hydrogen refuel stations we put in with the first uh, in the UK. So a lot of lessons have been learned from that. And, and I like to think if a similar size city or region was, was to start with a blank piece of paper, it wouldn't take quite so long. Obviously, this has been heavily subsidized by, as I said, UK, European and, and, and national government. So the financials have been very difficult to, um, would be very difficult to do without that subsidy. And, um, what, what, what we're keen to do and what we do on a weekly basis is try and share our learning with anybody that's trying to replicate this. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the one thing that is maybe stopped us is, is just that market availability. As I said, any any vehicles we've brought in have to have had to be prototype and first generation. And again, that's had a financial implication, but it's just meant they're not mark, they're, they're not off the shelf ready to, to progress at, at the pace we'd like. But we we think that's changing. We see more and more of the of the bigger organisations, Toyota, BMW, Hyundai, you know, developing developing their products. But also in terms of the electrolyzer space, there's more and more companies coming on board. So as that supply chain grows, the ability to 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 hit the ground running will increase. But obviously, heavy heavily yeah. dependent on subsidy at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. You're on mute there, Doris. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just said we also have one more question in the chat. Um, I would ask you either answer it quick or sure. in the chat because we already Time. have our yep. next speaker waiting. Yeah, I can answer it in the chat. I'll do that while we're progressing. Doris, okay, no perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Then I would ask Wolfgang Madl from Emprise to tell us more about uh, their hydrogen trucks and hydrogen logistics. So, sorry, hello from my side. I'm trying to share my screen. Just give me a moment. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay so uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to tell you a little bit about our hydrogen initiative at Emprise. Um, I learned I got 10 minutes, so I reduced it to a very comprehensive overview, uh, not a very comprehensive overview. Um, no, um, yeah, just it's changing. Yeah, probably before we get started quickly, um, Emprise is an Austrian based food retailer. Um, so predominantly our market in the, and our outlets are in the western part of Austria. We are headquartered close to Innsbruck, where we also have our main storage facility and also uh, food production uh, facilities. And so that's where we the whole story started, I would say, um, thanks uh, with our hydrogen trailer. I would like to start with the motivation why we were putting um, kind of focusing on hydrogen. Uh, it was about the ambition of the company uh, to contribute uh, our carbon footprint reduction. So the bar chart I'm showing here, it's not definitely not a full carbon, corporate carbon footprint as we require it today for ESRE. It's more like um, having a, a look at the direct use of energy in our operations and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. So as you can see, the left hand bar is always the energy consumption and the right hand bar would be the associated greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, as you can see, and sorry for the German in the graph, so we have basically um, three main uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The one would be the uh, consumption of natural gas in the different outlets. We have about 280 outlets today um, for facility heating. Um, another important source is uh, natural gas consumption in the uh, food production processes. Uh, that's mainly the bakery. So we, we operate an industrial sized bakery, uh, which consumes significant amount of, of natural gas. And the, the third uh, main contributor to our emission is, is the logistics. So we operate about 45 um, diesel trucks, which is a back to base fleet, which is uh, kind of transporting uh, the goods from our main production and storage facilities uh, to the different outlets. And this these trucks run six days, uh, some of them even seven days a week. Uh, uh, either, let's say, 50% or more in two shifts. Uh, so we are burning about 1.5 million liters of diesel today. Uh, and uh, years ago, we started to look on the possibilities to decarbonize uh, that sector. And we turned out that hydrogen might be a valuable option for that type of transport. Beside that, and I will show you that in a minute, also hydrogen might be a solution to reduce some of the greenhouse gas emissions from our food processing as well, substituting a portion of the natural gas. Um, so what's the project about? Um, as just mentioned before, um, hydrogen today is still away from being a survival solution. Uh, to substitute diesel, neither to substitute natural gas. Uh, so the whole project started about two major funded uh, programs. One is the demo for grids. It's a European funded program in the EU uh, Horizon 2020 program. It's focusing on the production of green hydrogen in pressurized alkaline electrolysis plants, uh, and this. Electrolysis should provide grid balancing um, services. So it means uh, specifically contributing in the secondary reserve market. Um, simply speaking, consuming energy where we have an over, let's say, overproduction of renewable energy in the grid, helping to stabilize uh, the frequency of the grid. So operating on demand of the grid operator. And the second project, it's a National Austrian National Funded Project by the Clima and Energy Fund. It's called High Rest. Um, it was also mentioned in the first presentation today from Viva Power and Gas. And the program is focusing on the demonstration of a regional hydrogen economy. Um, therefore, it's always basically linking three major projects in our area, which is the Embrace one, focusing on uh, vehicles. Yeah, uh, for for uh, transporting food to our outlets. Um, the, the program from Viva and Gas, which are looking into establishing a refueling station along a, a highway, and the Zillertal Bahn, which is looking into um, using hydrogen for a local train. Um, so there are three, three major projects going on, uh, and within the highways, we will link them, and it's a company also from research activity. Um, the next slide is providing a quick overview about uh, what we have already installed at the Enterprise. Basically, the whole idea started already back in 2018 with the application for the uh, first funded project. Uh, we were able to start to build the facility mid of 2020. Mid of 2020, and since May 2020. 22, uh, so basically a little bit more than one year, they are able to produce green hydrogen channel for our facility. Um, the, the whole electrolysis plant is connected to the grid. Um, hence, we are interacting with the grid either on the day ahead market or the intraday market. And the team is working on also to participate in the 
um, grid balancing market, uh, which is uh, kind of governed by the Austrian power grid operator. Um, so you can see there the, the grid connections, obviously you have transformers and rectifiers uh, to supply the electrolysis. The electrolysis has a capacity of 55 kilograms in hydrogen an hour, which is equivalent to about 1.3 tons of hydrogen a day. Uh, so the, the, the output stream from the electrolysis uh, it's around through a gas purification unit to meet the demand of fuel cell electric uh, vehicles. So it's a very stringent demand, which requires a very low number of residues. In our case, it's mainly to reduce the moisture and some residual oxygen in the stream. Uh, and after that, we have built a, a fueling station with two compressors. Uh, which are tailored for 350 bar uh, commercial vehicles. Uh, so we are refueling today our own first uh, fuel cell electric truck, but we also have um, supported uh, kind of you know, refueling of different other uh, truck operators or even uh, companies developing their own trucks that want to do some testing in the Alpine region. We have refueled also buses already. Um, so that works us quite nicely uh, with the 350 bar refueling protocols today. They are very, uh, let's say, kind of getting standardized. Uh, beside that, as mentioned, we also can use the hydrogen in our uh, food production plant uh, to, yeah, to, to burn it and uh, for, for process heat. So we need to process heat of uh, a little bit above 300 uh, degrees C. With a carrier so we can can use that to substitute natural gas or we also have the possibility um, to uh, fill uh, hydrogen trailers from multi-element gas containers uh, so that the hydrogen can be transported to other projects in the facility in the facility which have a hydrogen demand but no on-site production yet um, and as always mentioned Mentioned if it comes to discussion about hydrogen, it becomes about efficiency. So there are significant heat losses from the electrolysis process. Um, so we collect all the waste heat from the electrolysis uh, and we can use it all year round in our food production plants. So there's a significant amount of low grade heat, uh, water required for, for cleaning uh, and, and for also some part of the facility heating where we can use the the low grade waste heat from the electrolysis, which helps us uh, to achieve a quite significant um, system efficiency. Um, the small pictures indicate uh, or give a, a bit, little bit of an impression how the facility looks like. On the left hand side, you can see the electrolysis stack. It's a city stack electro, 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 electrolysis uh, unit. Yeah, uh, 340 cells in a row. Um, we have medium pressure storage vessels. Uh, the one, the, uh, the white one you can see, they help us uh, to decouple the time where we produce hydrogen from the time where we consume it, which is key uh, to operate the hydrogen, uh, the, the, the plant uh, during times with uh, high renewable power production and hence also low power prices. You always can also can see the burner and the, the boiler for process heat uh, production. It's a dual fuel burner, so we can either burn hydrogen or natural gas, depending on the demand. Uh, the refueling station, uh, you can see on the right hand side, and also our first truck, which we are testing currently together with the uh, company who's providing that truck um, in our day to day logistics. What well, you operate is a back to base fleet. So basically, with one refueling station, we can we can uh, refuel the whole fleet. Um, so if if the operation proves to be stable and becomes a more commercially uh, viable than it is today, um, so the target is to reduce uh, replace diesel truck by hydrogen trucks one by one if the, if the diesel trucks come to end of useful life um, and therefore we bring quite a 
uh, say a high performance refueling station with uh, civil refueling, which has a significant uh, capacity to also refuel drugs quickly and back to back without waiting time as uh, working time and working time restrictions of drivers is also key um, to get acceptance for the new technology. Um, if you want to learn more about the project, uh, we have a website established where you can see a lot of details, uh, also find a lot of additional resources. So uh, feel free to visit that uh, in case of any further questions. Uh, I guess you will find some, some more details there. Yeah, so I hope I made my 10 minutes and there is some time for questions in case there are any. Thank you, Wolfgang, very much. Um, yeah, are there any questions? I see one hand raised. Is this still from before? I think it is still from before. If there arise any further questions, you can just use the chat and ask your questions there, or um, you can also come back to me and I can forward the questions uh, to Wolfgang afterwards. Um, if there are no further questions, then thank you very much um, for your presentation. And I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. And then I ask Benedikt Utech from Wiener Linien to, about his input for the hydrogen buses. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So let me put my screen on for a second. Mm -hmm. So I hope the presentation is visible now. Yes. And then I would start. All right. So first of all, um, thanks for the invitation um, and a very warm welcome from the city of Vienna and myself. My name is Benedikt Utech. I represent the Wiener Linien. The Wiener Linien are the public transport company of, of Vienna. And today I would like to share our experience so far with the, the topic of hydrogen. So um, I would like to give you a quick of the uh, fleet we are operating right now um, uh, in the company might do to support the process of us purchase. And uh, therefore I can give you quite some input here. Uh, the first thing you will notice is that we actually have just two hydrogen buses right now. Uh, and you see the, the total amount of our fleet is uh, above 400. And this is a small amount, but uh, we can quite frankly say that we have some experience made so far, and um, we would like to share this book. The thing notable is that we are operating 12 battery buses right now. Ah, uh, Benedict, uh, sorry, I hear like microphone volume is like up and down all the time. Okay, let me check real quick. Okay, I hope it's a bit better now. I, I at the moment yes so okay <laughs> let's try um, again I will try not to move <laughs> okay um and we are operating 12 battery buses as well and um yeah the the back and bone of our fleet are actually the articulated buses which are 18 or 20 meters long so we can get the maximum amount of passengers from A to B our goal is um and this is also a significant um information to get away from the diesel buses and um, to the new yeah let's say clean buses and therefore are we therefore we are at the moment making test runs and um, try to gather as much experience as possible so in a few years we can make the big decision to which uh, technology we want to switch to we think in the long run it will not uh, be worth to operate both systems on a big scale so we are right now making the experience with battery buses, but also with hydrogen buses. So we can decide um, as best as possible to which technology we want to switch. 
Okay. Um, as seen before, we have two hydrogen buses in the, in the fleet at the moment. And those are yeah, stationed at our hydrogen competence center. This is one of our bus depots in the city of Vienna uh, in, the, in the, the district of Leopoldau. And it's a, a bus depot for approximately 150 buses and the two hydrogen buses. We also implemented there a hydrogen refueling station for one for 700 bar vehicles and also for 350 bar vehicles. So we are able to, to refuel both. Um, why this is necessary for us, I will come to you in a moment. The refueling station we have at the bus depot is currently, or well, is currently delivered or will be supplied by uh, hydrogen trailers which arrive on a weekly basis and uh, the refueling station at the bus depot is, is fixed. The reasons why we have uh, decided to test for hydrogen are the following. Yeah, the, the most important one is obviously the range for us. The, the hydrogen buses have way more range than battery buses uh, from from the information we have from manufacturers, we can reach up to 450 kilometers, and we also achieved that so far. Also, the buses have um, a very good handling and can manage the topography of Vienna very well. And also, obviously, the, the quick refueling time and the, the, the heat from the battery or from the fuel cell, let's say, can heat the bus in the winter as well, which is also a benefit for us. The, the main yeah, let's say reason or the main step uh, that, that was important for us was that um, we could right now replace one diesel bus with one hydrogen bus and could operate the whole um, bus system of Vienna with this. This is not possible with battery buses, therefore we, need, we would need a lot of more buses, but with hydrogen it would be possible. One benefit is uh, one benefit of working as a company owned by the city of Vienna is that we have sister companies, the Wien Energie and the Wiener Netze. They are both um, also public companies and um, help us quite a lot with the topic of hydrogen. For example, the Wien Energy produce the hydrogen and um, bring it in trailers to our refueling station. And the Wiener Netze are also responsible for the transportation of the hydrogen and are maintaining our hydrogen, hydrogen refueling system. And we are operating the refueling station and also the buses, obviously. So here you can see two buses we have at the moment in, in, in tests. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the bus from the company of Hyundai. And on the right-hand side was, is the bus of the company Solaris. The main difference between those two are the um, bar system, while the, the Hyundai bus needs 700 bar hydrogen, the Solaris bus only needs 350 bar. But therefore, we have to uh, withhold both pressure uh, types of uh, hydrogen to, to operate those. And um, it's for, for us, it's not quite sure yet uh, how the the technologies and how the manufacturers of the buses will go to which pressure and um, especially the Asian manufacturers are still um, withholding to the 700 bar system. So it was for us um, a very important decision to be able to refuel both systems. This is what we are planning to do on this year. Uh, on the left hand side, you can also see the, the Hyundai bus from the picture before, but we also plan on testing three more different type of buses in our city. And this is also very important for us because we want to gather as much information as possible before we buy one of those buses. And um, we know that's not always possible for like small cities, but um, with the city of Vienna and the, the volume or the, the amount of buses that needs to be replaced with hydrogen or battery buses, let's say, is very big. So we are kind of, it's easier for us, let's say it this way, to get the attention of the big bus manufacturer. 
And from the parameters, you can see above that uh, there are quite some differences differences between the systems and the, the 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 parameters of the battery, the fuel cell, and the the engine. And therefore, it will be quite interesting for us to see what these vehicles um, are able to bring on the street. Here's a photo of our hydrogen fueling station in Leopoldau. In the back, you can see the, the bus depot. And in the front, you can see the Hyundai fuel cell bus. And um, yeah, I think the, the, the main information from this picture is that two buses can be refueled uh, right next to each other. The compressor unit is on the left-hand side, and on the bottom of the picture, you can see the, the place where the hydrogen trailer is parked. Here are some more photos of our vehicle and of the refueling station. And this is like a detailed overview of our hydrogen, hydrogen filling station. It was built by the, the company Maximator. It's, I think, a German company. company. And um, yeah, at the left hand side, you can see the parking station for the trailers. And on the right hand side, you can see the, the hydrogen tanks and the electrolysis, no, not, not electrolysis, the, the compressor. We are operating two separate compressions, uh, both from the company of Maximator. Um, the reasons are that we have. To be sure to 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 have a backup plan when one is not working, and also for the separate pressure uh, regions of 700 bar and 350 bar. One of the things that we get asked quite frequently is um, what kind of distance we have to to be aware of or to to to. Um, okay, I'm missing a word right here. But as you can see in the background, uh, the houses are quite are not not quite far away from our from our bus depot, and the I think it's approximately five to six hundred meters, and um, there's also no sound problem whatsoever from the people living there. What we are also planning right now with our um, sister company, the Wien Energie is to build our own electrolysis station in the city of Vienna. Right now, we're getting supplied from the city of, um, um, where are you getting supplied? I, okay, I, have to, I have to look that up. We are getting supplied with the hydrogen at the moment, and but our plan is to build a own electrolysis station that can produce green hydrogen for us. It's currently in the, currently in the making. The, Electrolysis will be able to produce one ton of hydrogen per day. And um, I think in the next picture we see it better. Yeah, that's the current state of the construction site. But on the bottom, you can see that um, it's planned for the, as a short term solution, that the hydrogen will be uh, transported by truck to our bus depot and to other companies. And on the long term or long hand side, we plan on building our own pipeline to our bus depot so we can get more amount of hydrogen to a better condition or in a faster way. But this is, let's say, planned for the next years. Currently, this is the way to go by truck, and that will be all I think for the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benedict. Are there any questions? If not, then ask this, uh, the others before you can write your questions in the chat. And I have just a quick question. Do you plan to replace all your buses with hydrogen buses? Um, the decision has not been made yet. Okay. We know that um, there's there's uh, laws in the, the European Union and also in the, the the of the of the city of Vienna that we have to replace a certain amount of buses, and this will 
definitely happen. If it be, if it will be 100%, I can't tell yet, but um, there will definitely be a switch to to clean vehicles. If it will be, or well, whether it will be battery buses or hydrogen buses, we can't tell yet. We want to test both the kind of vehicles, but um, the the direction is clear. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, then I will ask Michael Richter from High Center for his experiences with hydrogen buses. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. And yes, I we can. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is Michael Richter. I'm from High Center Research. Uh, I will shortly also introduce our company. Um, and then um, dig into the topic of hydrogen buses and the projects that we are doing in this field of um, hydrogen research. Um, so our company is um, High Center Research. We are Austria's first research center exclusively focusing on hydrogen technologies since 2005. Um, currently this number is not correct anymore, so we have more than 80 researchers exactly from different fields, um, mainly from technical fields, but also um, business in, uh, and law. Um, so we have more than 18 years of experience in this field. Uh, and since 2023, we are also a Comet Center uh, in Austria. So this is a big international research program um, to also in, enhance the international, international research in, in hydrogen. Um, covering all fields from production, distribution, storage, and also different applications uh, in industry, mobility, and also um, in the energy sector. Um, so we built up a big international network in the last couple of years, and um, also we have these nice interconnection with the um, institutes of the of Graz University of Technology. So in total, we are currently, I think, close to 200 of researchers in, in uh, Theo Graz uh, focus, uh, doing research in, in, in the hydrogen um, sector. Um, so just a few words about this special project I'm, I'm talking today about. It, it was, it is currently in the implementation phase in the south of Austria in Villach in, at the station or at the plant site of Infineon, the semiconductor producer. Um, they are using hydrogen in their industrial process as a as a do, um, as a, um, a carrier gas for the dopants uh, and the production of the semiconductor chips. Um, and as it was before, they um, did use liquefied hydrogen that was transported to Villach um, over a distance of 700 kilometers, and then evaporated and used in this in the process. Uh, after washing most of the dopants and effluents out, the um, mixed it with a big airstream and then just de diluted it and released it to the atmosphere. So this is a big um, yeah, waste of energy, basically. Um, what we did in two projects was, first of all, introduce uh, hydrogen production by um, proton exchange membrane electrolysis um, on this stage that is currently um, in the commissioning. Um, then in the downstream, there was also the requirement to add a cryogenic purification because the there is a very high requirement of hydrogen purity in the process in order to um, leave out any other impurities and be sure that the quality of the chips is um, is met. Um, so we have we need a, a purity of 8.0. Um, this is way higher than in normal applications. Um, and in the end, we we did. Uh, an assessment study which possible after process pathways could be um, realized to in, in order to reuse the hydrogen. So we, we did assess an energetic utilization in internal combustion engines. Uh, also the same thing with a fuel cell, but there we would have need a, a higher quality. Um, the path of the hydrogen recycling was also um, investigated and the fourth pathway that was then decided to do was to um, purify the hydrogen and then supply a local fuel cell bus fleet and therefore um, being able to um, really couple different sectors um, by means of hydrogen. Um, 
in total, this just a sh um, short words on the emission. This would mean that we have in total um, on the site a very high um, saving of emissions of more than 8,000 tons of CO2 equivalents per year. Um, and um, um, have a quadruple emission mitigation, so we um, save gray, gray hydrogen. Um, then also we uh, we get we get rid of the um, high tro road transport because of the onsite production. They as well have a higher um, security of supply. Um, we then also do re reuse the hydrogen and. Um, have hydrogen buses instead of diesel buses. So this is a very nice project in total. Um, if there's also already planned the, the hydrogen refueling station on site, but this is still in the planning phase because of um, some financial issues that I will talk about in, in a few minutes. Um, the challenge here in the on the on the refueling station is that we need to refuel 40 buses a day with seven parallel back-to-back -back refuelings. Um, and we have to kind of, yeah, use the the hydrogen that is coming from the industrial process. So we have to dig up, decouple the industrial um, usage and the refueling. So we need also a big storage uh, interface at the refueling site itself. And there we did a lot of simulations, which uh, combination of different um, components uh, of the refueling infrastructure could be used to, in order to meet the requirements of this refueling station. Um, and also, um, since of this this um, number of buses at, um, refilled uh, back to back is not a uh, thing that is very common in Europe or worldwide, so this is also a new step to do. Um, from an energetic point of view, th this is a very important uh, compared to other because most of the time, uh, hydrogen buses uh, are, um, yeah, from different political politicians and also from different um, stakeholders in the in the uh, community. It's not that clear if hydrogen buses uh, make sense in, in the long term uh, from an energetic point of view. Uh, but for this specific pro um, project, we definitely could, can point out that this is even less energetic. Uh, they have, we have less in a, an energy consumption in total at the end than um, introducing a battery bus in Villach instead since we already have the hydrogen there uh, and um, currently just do not use it because we just blow it to the atmosphere. So this is a, um, these are many different um, aspects and, and, and reasons why this project is, um, is a, um, yeah, one, one, one of its kind and um, an energetic, from an energetic point of view, very, very viable project. Um, so what we are currently um, doing in Villach is that we have a, a running test operation with a mobile refueling station because the, the stationary station is not um, being implemented so far. Um, and we've been testing uh, five Solaris buses since the beginning of this year with a total consumption of about seven to eight kilograms per 100 kilometer in, in line operation. And um, we didn't have any uh, climatizing problems during also during uh, the winter time and during cold conditions. So this was very um, good experience basically. Um, and what we also did was that we uh, tested the bus at the University of Technology on a roller dynamometer and um, did some specific test cycles there um, with an average demand of five to six kilograms per 100 kilometer. And we use this data now also to doing optimization phases and simulations with a longitudinal dynamic simulation in order to um, also getting this um, the consumption down and uh, and optimize the operation strategy of the bus. Um, so I would just summarize the requirements for kind of um, this project. So in the first point, um, it's very in, yeah, it's, it's very important that the bus operator sh shows a high commitment to substitute the fossil fuel based fl fleet because actually they are, they are used to, to operate the um, fossil fuel based uh, fleets for a lot of, of the last years, basically without any technology change. So that means that you have to take uh, high risks associated with the implementation of the new technology and also 
be open to to certain required adaptations um, since you cannot uh, fully operate it the same in the same uh, way that you did uh, beforehand. Um, then what we also experience is that we have a very uh, high political willingness and involvement in the whole process from the very beginning of the project. This is also very important. Um, then that then you build up close collaboration both in with your stakeholders, with local authorities, and also with all um, uh, with the political um, um, decision makers that are involved in the process, and um, um, also focus on a knowledge transfer and education, since this is uh, very key, also in order to to have a safe operation of the technology, and. Um, to um, educate people around it, that they don't not um, believe everything that is that is published in media. Um, then also uh, next point is to to start with a small fleet at the beginning, because what we experienced not only in this project but in other projects as well, that um, all of these technologies, this this they are not at the, in a um, at the stage of the TRL where this is all. Um, produced in series and the, all of the vehicles are, uh, are working very fine from the very beginning. So it's always a learning and learning phase in, in every aspect. Um, so it's good to, to start with a small fleet, um, get a lot of experience and then also uh, try to, to do this knowledge transfer with other operators and with the, public, uh, with the public and as well with the manufacturers of the vehicles and the infrastructure in order, in order to, to um, improve the development process and also enforcing it. And so next point, it's, um, it's required that you have a reliable hydrogen supply. That's also um, um, according to the RED2 criteria. Also, I know that in Austria, this is not that easy. Um, and, and it's very, um, it's not so easy to understand what are the real criteria so far. Um, but be aware that, the, that you have also a backup solution for your hydrogen um, production since this is also not something that you just buy in the catalog and you get um, a 100 percent available system so you have to be aware of that anyways um, and um, also to do a, an in in depth intensive assessment of your requirements that you really need in the city or in the in the in the region where you are um, planning to to use your your bus in order to get a good technology um, solution uh, in terms of power of the fuel cell package, of the battery capacity, uh, of the required range that you need, how many um, refueling, um, or if you need an additional refueling during the day, um, what how, uh, how what requirements do you have, and stuff like that. So this must be uh, be very uh, thought about before you order the bus. Um, challenges that are associated with our project uh, specifically. Um, is that this is uh, in in many fa um, phases a uh, intensive R and D project, so you have always a high risk of delays, and you need some prototype uh, experience before you can take the final investment decision. Um, and also for as always, it's a it's a it's a financing um, financing issue, since um, in general uh, at mobility applications, the customers are generally more willing to pay more than, for instance, the industry. Um, but anyways, it's it's still a, a big hurdle to overcome uh, in comparison with um, state-of-the-art fossil fuel technologies. And this is also one thing that we uh, we were applying for financing by the funding program in Austria for buses. It's called EBIN, but it's basically the only one that you can currently sub, um, apply for the financing of the buses. For infrastructure, there are different solutions, but for buses, this is the, the substantially only one. And the challenge here is that our project, with all of these um, um, boundary conditions and the implementation also of the infrastructure, we have basically very high costs for buses and the infrastructure compared to competing projects. Um, and so we, we didn't get accepted in the first two calls. Uh, so we have now also applied for the third call. Uh, the decision should be placed this week, um, and um, this else also was the reason why the the, the the implementation of the the total phase of the project was delayed. Um, as I already told, the HRS for 40 buses is not something that is uh, is a serial product, so this is a high complexity as well, and also 
time uh, demanding and resource demanding in the engineering phase. Um, and the, 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 the next thing is that we have to um, implement a refueling station in the middle of an urban area where you also have to be aware of the public involvement and um, be aware that, they could, that, that you could have also further delays in the, uh, in the authority approval process. Um, and as a last point, we have uh, the thing that apart from the industrial usage of the hydrogen there, we have still no additional renewable hydrogen source in the area. So we probably would need an, as a backup solution, a trailer supply from Styria or even Vienna, so pretty far away. Um, yeah, then there are some challenges with the refueling station itself, but I think I've already talked about it. Uh, if there are any more questions, I'm I'm happy to answer that. And then I would thank everybody for listening. And yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for the really interesting presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the participants? If there will um, arise later on, please just either post them in the question or I think we will also be able to share your presentation with the participants, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So then you also have the um, then you ha also have Michael's contact data and can contact him uh, directly afterwards. I will now share my screen again, and now we start with our discussion slash workshop. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Then please go to menti.com and enter the following code and then I will start the Mentimeter presentation. So can you see the question now? Do you have any similar solutions in your city and if yes which ones? I would also like to ask the speakers of today, do you have one of the other presented solutions in your city? And if yes, which ones? Uh, please just unmute yourself and talk about it. I mean, and we have also a project in Graz, um, similar to the one that is implemented in Vienna. Um, but there we basically are also behind in timeline due to financial issues. Okay. But there's also the question, um, the plan to completely exchange the current uh, fleet from 170 diesel buses to 100% re uh, renewable solutions. And the question here also is uh, how many diesel or how many hydrogen buses and how mm. many battery buses make sense. Since we think uh, here that there will will be kind of a mix of the technologies, but it's still not decided um, which numbers are required. Okay. Then the next question would be, think about the challenges you face in the city. Which challenges could you solve by replicating either of the cases? And also for our speakers, I would like to ask you, which challenges did you solve by replicating uh, this case, uh, by, by, implementing <laughs> by implementing your solution? Maybe Benedict, you can uh, tell us which, um, uh, which challenges did you overcome by implementing the two hydrogen buses so far? So I didn't uh, understand the first part of the question, but uh, I think you asked what complication we faced with the two buses yet. No, which challenges you could overcome with implementing the hydrogen buses. Was there something like you said you want to implement them because you're facing some issues with legislation that you have to implement? Uh, I don't know how many electric or hydrogen buses. Well, well, implementing a, a new vehicle or a vehicle with a new kind of engine is always like difficult or for our uh, city and our um, administration. 
but I think the 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 biggest challenge or the the challenge we overcame the the best was actually the 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 building or and the I'm missing a word. Uh, Baugenehmigung. Um, uh, <laughs> um, the approving. Well, let, let's say the allowance for our uh, hydrogen building station from the city, and uh, we did it with, and we did it with uh, basically that that we wrote the concept and the 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 laws ourselves and made the uh, proposal to the city. And they were very happy that we already did the work for them. And the, the questions they had after that were very little. And um, we so could make a, a good discussion. And yeah, basically, we did the work for them and they were happy. And so we had rather few consequences. OK, cool. And I will just ask all participants, please just type in your answers in Mentimeter. Either use the link in the chat or uh, go to menti.com and use the code shown up in the screen. And also, Graham, which challenges uh, could you overcome by or solve by uh, implementing your hydro the hydrogen strategy? Yeah, thanks, Doris. I suppose the, um, the the issue we have in the city at the moment is quite a compact city. So in terms of the range uh, that can come with hydrogen, particularly with fleet vehicles like refuse collection vehicles, it, the range isn't really the attractive feature. For us, it's the, um, the ability to, as I said at the start of my presentation, the ability to grow an ecosystem where the local economy is supported by a renewable energy source that uh, that is made and used within the region. So that, that ticks a lot of boxes, particularly at the moment in terms of energy security, which is a, a big issue for us uh, for, and for everyone at the moment. So the ability to um, transition away from the fossil fuel alternatives onto renewable source that's, that's manufactured locally has been really attractive for us. So those challenges in terms of energy security and self-reliance uh, have really be, have come to the fore over the past few years. We also have um, the challenge going forward when looking to become net zero and particularly with zero emission tailpipe vehicles is the uh, hydrogen offers some alternatives that comes with electric vehicles in terms of grid capacity and downtime in terms of charging. Um, our fleet vehicles can be refueled with hydrogen within a matter of five minutes, then back out on the street doing the job they've been built to do. Whereas, as, as we know, with electric vehicles, they have to have that charge time. So in terms of delivering a public service, the hydrogen test bed we've, we've used, both with buses and with fleet vehicles, have shown you can sweat the asset, if that's the term I can use. You can use the asset more and more compared to the electric uh, equivalent and at the same time achieve that zero tailpipe emission policy that you're that you're trying to progress well cool. thank you graham no worries then i just go forward to the next question which stakeholders would you involve when you implement a solution like that and then uh, maybe I can ask Michael, which stakeholders did you involve so far? Yeah, basically, um, apart from the operator, um, then also the city of Villach, uh, the, the mayor there, um, then the um, local government of the state of Carinthia, uh, and many of, their, uh, of the decision makers there. Um, and then we all, we have also been planning to in, to involve um, the the citizens of Villach um, when we are when we are sure about the financing for the financing of the project, um, kind of an information leaflet and then also kind of a workshop of the uh, of all of the uh, citizens that are living nearby in order to to uh, to answer their questions and um, about all their doubts that they have about the technology and how it, this is working how safe it is and stuff like that 
this is basically the plan that we also um, did in, in the city of Graz. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. From the other speakers, did you involve some uh, some other stakeholders, as Michael just mentioned at the moment? Honestly, I could I could come in there if, if that's okay. One one of the big issues and challenges we find uh, when utilising hydrogen vehicles is the actual skill set around technicians and maintenance to uh, to keep the vehicles on the road. So as part of our journey with hydrogen, we've really involved that kind of skill sector. So higher and further education, technical colleges, the uh, supply chain that centers around maintenance and facilitation of hydrogen vehicles. We've seen that as one of the key stakeholders when progressing with hydrogen. And actually it's still one of the biggest challenges trying to identify uh, technicians and maintenance providers that have that hydrogen skill set. Not just hydrogen, the high voltage as well that comes with mm -hmm. electric vehicles. It is a real challenge for us at the moment. Okay. Did you also involve like grid providers? Yeah, so the so the local utility companies uh, very yeah. important uh, as we progress. Um, there's, uh, as you can imagine, there's a there's a whole scramble a across the whole country to try and reach net zero as soon as possible. So there's lots of um, there's lots of regional, national, and local. Uh, policy and funding opportunities that that, that, all, that are all in place. So we, as the council, we've tried to act as an enabler mm. to bring the right people together to make the most of any opportunities. So that kind of stakeholder engagement has been a big part of our core task over the past 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Then I just go on to the next question. Did you face, also to the speakers, did you face any legal barriers so far? And do you have, um, uh, or which legal barriers could be uh, a barrier for the implementation? And also for our stakeholders and our participants in the chat, which legal barriers do you think you can face? And um, which EU national and local policies could also be a barrier for an implementation? What would you think that there might be some problems. I think my fellow speakers have I've have, have talked about it already. Just the, the kind of licensing of new technology and vehicles on the road has has been an issue. Um, any research and development program comes with the issue of trying to get this uh, through legislation. And I think Manuel at the start really made a good point in terms of we could have a set of or regulations that, that um, cross borders so we're all working to the same type of protocol I think that'd be a lot easier in terms of accelerating this technology um, yeah having the having the same guidance uh, across all countries would be really useful I think in terms of getting the hydrogen off the road on the mm. road. The, the, the lack of regulations and um, legislation is something that we've recognized here so there are certain work groups progressing that in, in the UK now to try and get that kind of consistency across regulation. Mm -hmm. Still early days. Yeah. Michael, do you know about uh, legislations in Austria? Yeah, I mean, we are also involved in some um, development process of legislations so or doing uh, guidelines and the, um, but it's it, it there's, there's still a big lack of it, um, so it's normally that they they are just um, using current existing legislations for natural gas, uh, for instance, in pipelines and also in, in refilling stations that are operated with natural gas currently. Um, and uh, also the authorities do not know which um, legal leg or legislation background they should use to to do the approval process. And this is also like what I said with. Uh, um, if the education of the authorities that are, that are required, so we need guidelines um, for both of the for the operators, for the uh, um, for the applicant, uh, applicants, and then also for the authorities to to uh, have a decision ba a decision base on on which they can do their decisions. Um, and there are there are there are um, activities happening on the European level uh, in Austria as well, but. Um, um, 
I definitely um, I t totally agree with Graham um, that this is uh, this, the requirement is to to, um, to have not um, I don't know 32 different um, legislations in Europe, but that we have one that is that is um, applied everywhere. Yeah. Mm. But this is this is in the process, and also when we talk about that, then this is required to have the same. Um, boundaries uh, and um, connectors, for instance, for trailers and for vehicles, uh, the same stuff that we have with uh, with um, with charging um, um, with charges for, for 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 mobile phones. Right. So this is what we what we see here that all of their um, sub users and uh, operators of, of trailers currently are developing their own solution. And this doesn't make sense at all in my point of view. Yeah. Yeah, that problem we have flash head with electric mobility as well. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much. I just go on to our next questions. Uh, I think you mentioned already some, Michael. Um, do you have any recommendations uh, for an EU policy that could facilitate um, the implementation of hydrogen mobility? Also for, for our participants, please just enter your recommendations. Maybe it just something that would facilitate it. So maybe Manuela has some uh, recommendations as well, or uh, Wolfgang, Benedict. Let's try to get the other speakers. <laughs> as well as someone else uh, from the participants. If you want to speak as well, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, I would recommend to look uh, what is going on somewhere else. Um, as example, in the US, uh, in uh, California, it is possible to put uh, um, uh, hydrogen refueling uh, station next to a diesel. And uh, here it's, yeah, not really possible. It's uh, not regulated, it's uh, unclear. And uh, when it works somewhere else in the, wor in the world, it could also work in the EU. I guess. Mm. Yeah. Would you have other recommendations? If not, then I would just continue to the next question. And that's already our last question today. What could be the financial source for financing the implementation? I think we already heard several sources of financing today. Um, also, some like interact funds, which are not feasible anymore at the moment, or not um, you cannot get to them anymore. But yeah, um, Benedict, how did you finance the two buses? Was it just by the budget of the company or via uh, projects or funding? No, we didn't do it ourselves. We got help as well from the, the city of Vienna and also national funds that also could have been European funds. So uh, we mostly paid the, the amount what a diesel bus would have cost and mm -hmm. the other amount we, we got funded. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it would have not been possible. I think with the, the refueling station we have, this was the investment um, was made uh, a loan from the city of Vienna to, mm -hmm. to be this kind of um, first uh, uh, to be the first player on the market to to do such a step and um, get this technology rolling. But without the funding, it would have not been possible so far. Or it will also not be possible for the for the near future to 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 buy these buses. Yeah. Wolfgang, how was it for you? Uh, I think you said you were also funded by the EU. Actually, it's a mix. Yeah, so there was a combination of different for different parts of the project. We used different funding, EU, European Union funding, um, national funding, um, a lot of enthusiasm from the owners. Yeah, actually, 
behind that. And uh, currently we are applying for the ENIM um, funding, which would be a funding for trucks, yeah, which the coins kind of, you know, currently under evaluation. Let's see if this gets yeah, some additional help uh, to get more vehicles on the road actually. Did you also receive funding or financial support for the hydrogen that you used? No. Because, uh, no? Okay. No, it's not. It's, uh, that, that's, that's basically we try to kind of, you know, like, um, we, we got some within the research projects for testing and commissioning, of course. Yeah, it's basically kind of the project, but not for the production itself. Yeah. There you need to find a smart way about um, leveraging the facility, uh, especially during times which are where you have access to very low cost energy. Yeah, which is nicely because it's also the, the time where you have excessive uh, renewable power. I mean, if if you operate now on a during summertime on a Sunday evening uh, afternoon, yeah, with uh, excessive PV production, yeah. So we even sometimes get money for consuming uh, electric power. Yeah, but of course the the capex is is the challenge if you run only uh, little hours a week. Yeah, your capex portion is, is enormous. Yeah, so we uh, need to find the balance, and that's also why we have now during the ramp up phase of our own fleet, we are supporting other projects which require green hydrogen. Yeah, um, that we deliver with trucks. Um, so, which gives us more utilization and the other safety investment at that point in that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers. And I just go on to at the last part of today, our next steps. Um, so, what will be up next in Reciprocity Project? Um, first of all, we will give all of the participants um, the slides of today. And if no one objects of the speakers, we will also hand out the recording uh, of the meeting today. And next up in the project is our final event and the last on-site event that we will have. It's the Mobility Assembly in Regensburg. Um, it will be from 28th to 29th of September and cities can still apply for travel vouchers. So for financial support to come to the mission, it's only for travel and hotel costs up to 400 euros till the end of July. Um, but you can find everything in the link that my colleague just posted into the chat and some of the highlights there will be the traffic congress regensburg uh, we will see some emission-free public transportation there we will have some site visits, site visits but they are still to be confirmed the autonomous people move that i have e-car sharing and ev charging and we will also get to know more about the regensburg mobility innovation ecosystem and what else is new? We have now our arrival platform. It's a match matchmaking platform for all investors, for um, um, suppliers, and also for interest parties of smart mobility solutions. It was uh, implemented together with the entrance project. It's another EU funded project. And there you can find, first of all, best practice by uh, examples you can find training materials also like this video you can find market analysis analysis so far you can find legislations advices and funding opportunities um, and of course it's just like a collaboration um, tool for you to get to know each other to get to know the um uh, the ecosystem, the smart mobility ecosystem, get listed and you can also just use it as an example, as a marketing tool to show your solution, which solution do you have, which solutions are out there and also make like maybe an analysis yourself. Uh, what is my solution on the market um, valuable or do I need to uh, redefine my business model as an example? Just some uh, insights. That's it so far. Are there any further questions? If not, then I say thank you very much to our speakers. Thank, thanks to our participants. And I'm really looking forward to see you again uh, during the reciprocity timeline and also afterwards.
Thank you and goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Thomas. you. Yeah.